The purpose of IRSCL is to enhance research into children and young people's literature reading and related fields. We aim to provide a forum for discussion in these areas and to encourage collaborative research. We encourage you to enjoy, join IRSCL if you haven't already, and that there are many benefits of being a member, including access to a global network of scholars in your field, mentoring opportunities, and being able to apply for awards and travel grants. It's an opportunity to be part of a community and to build your career. Um, and um, I, th um, I think um, Justina is now, um, Macarena Garcia Gonzalez is going to be the new um, coordinator of the mentoring program, but Justina will now say a few words about how this program developed. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I worked on it uh, for years, almost four years, and it has been really just a wonderful experience. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the current mentees, some of them are here with us, actually for inspiring this meeting because it was their idea. Uh, and uh, they provided some of the questions for uh, Roxanne. Uh, so I just want, um, I want to let you know that uh, that once again, this was their idea, and, and I, uh, I, do, I do appreciate um, their contribution. Um, so I think, Nicola, you can introduce Roxanne, and then I'll just say a couple of words about the, the structure of the meeting, and then Roxanne will start, finally. Okay, thank you, Justina. It's my great pleasure to introduce Roxanne Hard, who is Professor of English and Department Chair at the University of Alberta, August, Alberta's Augustana Faculty. She is a Fulbright Scholar and a McCullough University Professor and researches and teaches American literature and culture, focusing on children's literature and popular culture. She's published over 50 peer-reviewed articles and her most recent books have been award winners, including The Embodied Child, co-edited with Lydia Kokula, from, published by Routledge in 2017, which was the winner of the IRSCL 2019 Book Award, and also by Routledge in 2021, Consumption and the Literary Cookbook, co-edited with Janet Vesalius which was the winner of the South Atlantic Modern Languages Association 2021 Best Book Award. So you can see we're in very good hands for a seminar about academic writing and publishing. Roxanne is also the Senior Editor of International Research in Children's Literature, which is the journal associated with IRSCL. Roxanne, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. It's my pleasure to, uh, I think Justine's going to say something a little before you start, is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> so I just want to say that, uh, Roxanne, if we could maybe ask you to, to start with just sharing your uh, general ideas, uh, your insights, your, you know, from your experience, and then we'll move on to the questions that um, the mentees provided. And then hopefully there will be time for questions from the audience uh, as well. So I think we can now start the gist of the, of the meeting. Please, Roxanne, and thank you so thank much. Thank you, Justina, and thank you, Nicola, for that lovely introduction. Um, okay, so Justina had asked me to sort of talk about um, my career path in terms of academic publishing, and I think the I think the 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 light bulb turning on for me was I did my first two degrees at the University of Saskatchewan, which has um, a, a good certainly a good English department. Um, but I did my PhD at Queen's, which is a, a top five university in, in Canada. And at, at the University of Saskatchewan, um, there very much seemed to be the mentality about going to conferences and, you know, getting, getting some travel in and getting out there to conferences and, and uh, not really a lot of encouragement about publishing. And when I went to, when I got to Queen's, and of course I had actually tapped into grad student funding to go to a conference when I was doing my master's in Saskatchewan. And then I got to Queen's and asked about conference funding for PhD students. And I was told, absolutely not, you need to publish. Um, we don't need you footering off to conferences, which I mean, conferences are great, but um, we, you need to publish or you're not going to be viable on the job market. And um, I was an older student. I was in my 40s when I did my PhD. So when I finished my PhD, my early 40s. And, um, and so I was very much about getting a tenure stream job. Um, the market was, uh, 
competitive then, now it's almost impossible in Canada, but um, we're going through a bad patch here, particularly in Alberta where I am. So I, I basically worked very hard to do the best term papers I could for my graduate courses and published most of them. Um, and, and now that I've been in, in my job for um, you know, 16, 17 years, I've, um, I've been on several hiring committees. And the thing that I have found charming about the hiring committees is that you get these CVs from these, these job applicants and they, they, they quite often look like mine in that the early publications are all over the place. They're not focused because they're coursework papers. <laughs> and, and so you end up with publications on things that are nowhere near the area where you want to work, but you put the work into this research project and you publish the paper, you get a good grade on it and then you publish the paper. So um, coming into my, my job, I held a postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell University for two years after my PhD. And that was two years of dedicated research. I highly recommend a postdoc. Um, if you can get one, it's a really good gig because it's dedicated research time. And so I came into my job with a substantial number of publications, but again, they were all over the place. And I trained in American literature and culture um, and began to focus on children's lit pretty much as soon as I got into my job. So my first major grant as a faculty member was for a children's literature project. And I think that's all I need to say um, about that. Uh, for me, it was always about good, careful research, crafting, the best paper I could, and then taking that paper and getting advice from the faculty member most relevant to that paper um, to turn it into an article for submission. And then sending it off and being prepared to take your lumps. Um, you know, you can, you can keep a file folder of rejection letters if you want to. I don't think it's particularly good for your spirit. Um, but you, you have to know that things will be rejected. And the idea, of course, is that you are going to get good enough that you're not going to be faced with desk rejections, which is what we call, what editors call the papers that come in and simply are not at a state where we could even send them out for peer review. And they go back to the author, sometimes with good advice, sometimes with just this just isn't suitable for the journal, sometimes because it's just really not a subject area the journal publishes in. Um, so I don't know where to go from there. Um, <clears throat> so the way those processes work, hopefully you get to the point where you've figured out what your paper is really about and where it should go. And you've sent it to the appropriate journal so you're not faced with a desk rejection. And it goes out for peer review. And then at that point, um, Hopefully it won't be a rejection. It might be a revise and resubmit, meaning it will have to go through the entire peer process again, the peer review process again, um, or various stages of, of accept with revisions, with minor revisions, with major revisions. Um, and, and then you have to work through those processes and you can't get particularly precious about, about this. Um, all writing can be made better. So even things, I try not to actually look at things I've already published because I know that I would go, oh, I really should have done something different here or there. Um, but um, look at, at the peer review responses, responses from editors as opportunities to improve your scholarship, to improve your writing ability. Um, I tell my students, writing is a continuum and you know, I am further along this road than I was 20 years ago, but I'm not at the end of it by any stretch of the imagination. My writing will always continue to get better as long as I'm doing it. So um, yes, do look at, at, at all of these stages as opportunities for growth as a scholar. Um, I, I think now I should turn to questions. Um, I, I've ordered, I have six questions and I have ordered them. So I'm going to start with some particular stuff and move to some of the bigger questions. I have a long question that basically 
I'll just read the first part of it. If my article touches on politically sensitive issues, would it be advisable for me to inform the journal or book editors about the sensitive nature of my work and ask them not to look for certain peer reviewers that may reject my work based on political or ideological grounds? Um, and the, the, the person goes on to give me some context about the article. And it's a, an article, I guess, that was critical of a particular government. And um, I guess that didn't fly. Um, well, I, I think that there would be nothing wrong. I would not be unhappy to get an accompanying cover letter from a contributor, a potential cr contributor to the journal to say that um, this, this article is, um, takes on a, takes on some particular ideological political stances um, in in quite a critical fashion, and it would be better if my work wasn't sent to people perhaps in the country um, in question, uh, depending on on what the subject is. Um, in which case, as as editor, I would certainly find the best reviewers possible, keeping that in mind. Um, obviously, we're not going to, at this, at the journal I edit, um, or the other one I edited, we're not going to shy away from, from particular political issues or stances. Um, we're looking for the best scholarship possible. And, and there's nothing wrong with, um, with saying it would probably not be a good idea if my work didn't go, it would probably be good if my work did not go to A, B, or C. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sending a laundry list, but I recently, um, I recently placed an article uh, and worked closely with a guest editor on it and sent off another article to another uh, venue and in the same subject area and said, don't send it to the person who had been the guest editor because we just work together and there's no way it's gonna be a blind peer review. She's gonna know it's me. And I would know from her comments that it was her. Um, and of course we want blind, double blind peer reviews. We don't want our contributors to know who is reviewing their work. And we don't want our reviewers to know who has contributed this work. Um, you know, it's not a good idea for somebody who's been asked to do a peer review to start searching the web to see if they can find out who wrote the article. It's the, the, this, this arm's length reviewing is the best way to get the, the best review, um, the most objective review. And, and then of course the most objective review is, is going to be the one that gets the best um, revisions out of the contributor. So I think, I think I've answered that question good enough. Um, there's, yes, there's nothing wrong with, um, don't suggest potential reviewers, um, but if there is going to be a conflict of some sort, do say don't, don't send it to. Um, for example, don't send it to my recent thesis supervisor <laughs> because they're going to know it's me. Um, so, so that's perfectly fine. Um, somebody asked a question, uh, for people who are not native English speakers, is a language revision by a specialized revision center suggested before submitting an article? Or is this a service included in the journal peer review process? Uh, well, the answer to that one is, is no. Um, the answer to the first question, should you, you get a revision center? That's up to you. Um, if you're feeling that unconfident about about your ability to write well in English, then you should be consulting with people who will help you get your English sorted out. And if, if it's a just a case of um, of taking it to to something like a writing center to polish it up and edit it, uh, that's that's on you. Um, uh, it's a service that is not really included. The journal journals don't have money. Um, we flat out don't have money. We don't make money. <laughs> we, uh, we, we try to be a nonprofit as in, as in we pay for ourselves, um, but we're not banking money and we don't have money for that sort of thing. So it's not a service that, that, that IRCL offers, certainly. 
Um, the main do's and don'ts when editing and polishing an article. Well, that's kind of a complicated um, question that was part of this, this question about getting things done well in English. Um, I, I think that I think that the more that you're doing this, that the, the, the more experience you have with academic publishing, um, the more you understand when an article just needs to go away um, in terms of you've done everything you can to it. Uh, but when you're starting out, as most of you are obviously, um, when you're starting out, this is when you have other people read it. Um, when you have your, your professors read it, your, your close colleagues in your graduate programs read it. Um, I know most North American um, institutions have writing centers and those writing centers quite often will have people who are dedicated to looking at graduate work. So that's a good place to take it. Um, and those non-specialist readers or the people who do not have expertise in the area of your research are the ones who are going to be able to, to stand back and to say, um, I don't understand what your argument is. I don't understand how you're using the theory. Um, I don't, I, I found this very hard to read because you didn't, you didn't give me the kind of signpost that I need to keep me with the article. Those are the people that will really help you make it reader friendly, right? Um, um, you're going to get to the point where you really are the, the expert on the content, on, on, your, on the primary text, on the secondary sources, on the theoretical framework. Um, but all of those other readers will help you smooth it out and polish it up and make it accessible. The chances are very good that, that when, if it goes past, say me as the editor, um, and I, I say this is ready for peer review, then it will probably go to somebody who is an, a close subject specialist and somebody who is less close. So someone on the editorial board who works, works in a particular area, but not right on, on the topic. And that second person needs to be pleased as well, because that second person is the one who's going to say, I can't follow this because, because the logic has broken down or something like that. So um, the main do's and don'ts, the main do is get lots of readers um, at this stage of your careers, get, get lots of people to review and, uh, and then you will get to the point where you don't know what else to do with it. It's pretty good. People are reading it and saying, this is pretty good. I think you should send it out. Then do send it out. And, and at that point, hopefully it's ready for peer review and your peer reviewers will tell you what it needs. And that's when you can go back to it with a fresh set of eyes. Um, you've had some space. Generally, peer reviews are not coming back. You know, kind of a minimum of six weeks. So could be three months, could be longer than that. Um, the timeline, I can talk about timeline later if you guys want. And, um, and then when it comes back to you and you will have a list of revisions, hopefully you've had, had reviewers who are, who've taken the time to actually drop comments into the paper itself, um, who have you know, filled out the rubric that we send them to fill out and have addressed all of the things we ask them to address and that will give you a really good way forward. Um, and then you will be asked during the review process to, to make a document, keeping track of the things you've done and how you have addressed every one of the, the reviewer's concerns or not. You may choose not to in, you know, in some cases, and you'll need to say, I didn't, and this is why. So there, I think, I think that's, that question is done. Uh, next one. When submitting to a themed issue of a journal, do the editors accept more essays than they can include and then cut certain ones once they read the final drafts? Yes, yes, they do. Um, but the point is that um, there's still, so for a themed issue of any journal, if it's a peer reviewed journal, you will send in a proposal for, for the issue. The editor or guest editors or whoever will say, yes, I'd like to see the paper. Um, that is not a guarantee of anything. And then you will get the paper in on time. And frankly, I like themed issues the same way I like uh, book collections, chapter, um, essay collections, because there's deadlines, right? Um, 
basically a general issue of a journal. There's no, there's no one giving you any deadlines. It's like, yeah, whenever you get it in, it goes into the queue. Um, so for me, once it goes through the peer review process and I accept it, the article will go into the queue for the next general issue. But IRCL right now, I'm accepting papers now for a gen the next general issue I have openings is 2024. Um, because we are very, uh, we are very full right now. Um, we've, we've got a lot of good papers coming in. So uh, for a guest, a guest editor for a themed issue, they are going to get, get the papers in. Um, and the, this, the second part of this question, once they read the final drafts, yes, um, they're, then they're going to send them out for peer review or not. They're, they might do desk rejections if the paper's not, not up for it. They'll send it out for peer review if, if it's ready. And then once they get all of those back in, then they have to compose their issue. And there will be probably an excess because you're always worried that you're not going to have enough. So you take too many, um, cause I have done, I have guest edited a few special issues for other journals. Um, the most recent one was for girlhood studies. I did a, a rape culture um, issue last, last year. And, and at that point, um, if the essay has passed peer review, and there isn't room for it in the themed issue, it will go to the journal for the next general issue. So you won't be part of the themed issue if you don't, for whatever reason, sometimes it's about, um, it's about fit, it's about saying, okay, well, these, these six or seven or eight articles go together very well, and this, this is what I want to have for my themed issue. So, and then everything else will go to the, the journal senior editor to be included later. So um, that's what happened with me. And actually for the, um, this, we have a forthcoming special issue of IRCL and there was one paper um, that passed peer review. The, edit, the guest editors felt it was not the greatest fit. And for me, I thought it was a great paper. And in, but instead of keeping it for a general issue, because I have so many, I actually passed it on to the editors of Girlhood Studies because it was very topical for that journal. So I did kind of a nice little editor exchange there. Um, certainly, you know, gave them a great paper that fits very well and also adds to their international focus. So, so it was a very nice, you know, nice collegial kind of thing to do. And it also meant that that, that contributor's paper will be published sooner than I could actually publish it. Um, so that was, you know, kind of a win-win all, all the way around. Um, the rest of this question uh, says, does getting a proposal accepted to a journal mean it will get published? Um, and the answer is absolutely not. A proposal is, is, a, is very different from a finished article. So, um, I, you know, I love themed issues, um, but that doesn't mean that, that when I send off a proposal that gets accepted that my paper will end up in that themed issue. And in fact, um, I had a, a paper, I was co-author on a paper with one of my students. And we sent, we sent her paper, and this was her research, definitely a very different sort of, of, of um, reading than I normally do. And we sent it off to a themed issue. Um, the proposal, yes, please send us the paper. We sent in the paper. Um, the paper passed peer review, but there was not space for it. It was not the best fit for the themed issue. So it was it was going to be passed on to the editor of that journal. And I realized that we would have to, because the themed issue was very different from what the journal normally publishes. Um, it was very much a social science -y themed issue for a very literary journal. And I realized that I would, we would have to pretty much reconstruct the whole paper if we wanted to stay with that journal. So we actually pulled it and submitted it to a journal where it fit better and it was accepted and it's out now. So that's, I mean, those, you have to make those calls, but you really have to be aware of your venue. What is this journal about? What does it do? What is it looking for? Pay attention to it, spend some time with it, read some articles from it um, and, and go from there. Uh, the next question is, how can we balance scientific information with personal opinion analysis, both quantitative and qualitative? Um, when is it too much of one or the other? 
I think this is the point where your um, th the question is is difficult to answer. Um, but I'll put it this way. You need to step back from the minutia and look at your overarching thesis. What is your argument? What is this paper intending to prove? Um, what is its focus? What is it about? And then once you have that, that, that argument, basically, how do you support it? So um, personal opinion is, well, you know, opinions are like buttholes. Everyone's got one. Um, and of course, in this particular age of so much misinformation floating around, um, I, am, I am heartily sick of people's opinions, particularly about things like vaccines and pandemics. Um, <clears throat> but your analysis, you said you like this was personal opinion slash analysis. An analysis is not a personal opinion. Your analyses of your primary texts um, with support from your theoretical framework and your secondary sources, your critical sources, is, is an informed opinion that you have arrived at after putting in a good deal of work. And that analysis or those sets of analyses are the evidence with which you're supporting your argument. So whether those analyses um, qualitative or quantitative data and, and the analyses of those sets, um, you need to figure out how that fits in to support your argument. This is why, um, I mean, one of the, one of the most, um, the biggest signpost for me that I've got a, gotten a paper from a grad student is that there's a lovely introduction and, and an argument. And then all of the theory, the theoretical framework is just there in a chunk and never referred to again in the rest of the paper. That there's this, this front loading of theory that I, you know, I'm, going to, I'm going to use, you know, Dara does look at, at um, morning to unpack these picture books. And then, then the theory is explained, examined, but it's not really used or referenced in the rest of the paper. And this is something that, that that grad students do. This is something I did as a grad student. Um, so when you think about your theoretical framework, think about it as a framework that is actually holding up containing the entire article and that, that it needs to be visible throughout, used throughout. These are your tools, right? Your, your theory is, your is a set of tools. The secondary criticism is another set of tools to support your own readings. You can, you can use it uh, to support. You can actually argue with it to say, no, my reading is better but it needs to be present. So going back to the question, um, when is it too much of one or the other? Uh, it's too much or too little of one or the other when it's not in support of an overarching argument. You, know, you think of, you think of your, your introduction and your thesis and you think that every section actually needs to feed back to support that argument. And it, if it doesn't, then it's superfluous and should be edited right out. I hope I'm being clear. Uh, the next question is, <laughs> how can we excel in academic writing so that major academic publishing houses publish our work? Well, um, I think I've given you lots of ideas so far about the steps you need to take, the kind of work you need to put in, um, the, the number of consultations you should be doing at early stages in your career to move things forward. Um, and attending things like this. I think, uh, you know, something like this would have been really useful for me when I was a grad student. Um, I would have appreciated it greatly. Uh, so this is a lot about getting out of your comfort zone and, and hearing hard truths from people. Um, getting your work out there. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing mostly uh, women in this crowd. Oh, there I see a Daniel. So it's not and a Eugene. So hi, guys. Um, but I have found throughout my long career that women are actually, um, maybe it's just the way we've been conditioned throughout our lives, but we take rejection better and we learn from it better. 
And I work, I have a lot of male colleagues at my little faculty here, which is part of a large research intensive university and also a top five university in Canada. Um, I have a lot of male colleagues who don't like to send out their work because they don't want to take it on the chin. And I found that my female colleagues are much, um, much better at rolling with the punches as it were and learning from good advice. Um, remember, we're not, here as editors, um, senior, senior scholars, scholars uh, or colleagues to knock you down. We want to build you up, but in order to do that, we have to tell you what's going on that isn't working with, with this or that in, in a particular paper that you want to publish. And of course, if you're turning your dissertations into a monograph, um, if that's what they are, and some mine wasn't. Mine was always going to be a series of articles, and 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 that's where it landed. Um, <clears throat> but if if you know if you're thinking this dissertation is a monograph, there's a big leap between what it looks like as as a defendable thesis and the monograph you want it to become, and you will need to work very hard with book editors. Um, I'm also actually the book series editor for the Children's Literature Association. And we have two, uh, two book series. One is just a straight scholarly series that publishes monographs and collections. And the other one is the uh, centenary series. So we have collections of essays on books that are turning 100. So I think the next one coming out is on the Velveteen Rabbit is turning 100 and we have a, a collection of essays coming out on that and we work with the University Press of Mississippi um, so they publish all of these these books for the Children's Lit Association so when junior scholars come to me with dissertations <laughs> there's actually a book on how to turn your dissertation into a book um, <laughs> I kind of direct them there because it's a lot of work and for one thing a dissertation tends to look like the first draft of an article by a grad student in that the theory is all front loaded and then abandoned completely. So um, that that chapter that is a lit review or a theoretical framework has got to be dismantled and used throughout the rest. So it's a it's a big project to turn your dissertation into into a publishable book. Um, I think it's a good project. I've been working, I have a junior colleague in, in, in my department here that I've been working with to get hers out. Um, I think she's gotten some very bad advice from uh, a book editor at a university press here in Canada. And I've been kind of trying to work against that because it's held things up longer than it should have done. Um, you can't take five or six years to do this flat out. If this is gonna take five or six years then don't do it. Get some articles out of it and move on flat out. You're, you're at the early stages of your career and you need publications because you need a job. So um, I'm also very practical minded. Okay, um, th then the last question that I have is what can we do to detect and avoid predatory publishing? Well, first of all, learn to delete any email that says we'd like your work because nobody's going to do that from a reputable publishing house or journal. I am never going to do that. <laughs> I'm not even looking for guest editors for special issues right now because I have such a long queue for the general issue that I need to get those articles out. So yeah, no one is going to contact you for your scholarly work that isn't after your money. So just, you just hit delete. Don't even open them up. Just hit delete and your life will be much easier. And don't fall for it. Um, I have colleagues here, senior colleagues in the, at this, this university who are falling for this and then coming to, I used to be re, um, the associate dean research here, so in charge of the funds, right? And they would come to me to say, well, I need $1,200 to publish this article. And the answer was no, no, you don't. You need to publish that article in a peer reviewed journal, which will not, will not charge you anything. And in some fields, there are page proof costs, but those, I mean, the, the, the journal nature, which none of you are gonna publish in, um, has page proof costs because it's an established journal and because it likes glossy pictures and glossy pictures are expensive. So, um, and that's another thing, another quick tip, probably if you can avoid it, don't build an article around images or charts or graphs, unless you absolutely, I mean, charts and graphs are better. Images are bad because A, you have to get permission and you're quite often going to have to pay for it. And then B, you're going to have to pay 
to get it into the journal because it's expensive, or you're going to have to cut words out of your article because your image counts as words. So if you can avoid it, avoid it. Um, not, not easy to do if you're working on picture books, uh, but I have published on picture books and I have avoided it. So that's the end of the questions I have. Um, and now I guess I'm happy to take questions from anybody. Yes, if I may just uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roxanne. Uh, that was so insightful. Uh, great advice also for myself. <laughs> thank you. Uh, now, uh, with the predator, predatory uh, publishers or journals, I think they also kind of pick up something that you've already published very often, and they, and they want you to, I mean, to conference papers, them. actually, yes, they're really, yes, they're really good at mining conference, yeah, um, yeah. conference uh, programs, and then sending That's out true. mass emails to everybody who was at this conference say, hey, we saw this, and we would really, yeah, don't just hit delete. Anybody who comes to you and says, hey, I saw this, if you don't recognize the name in the subject line, just hit delete. Mm -hmm. and, and there was something that you mentioned about reviewers, uh, like a, a reviewer being a, a former PhD supervisor, for example, right? And recognizing the, uh, the, the paper. But I think it's also on the part of, of these reviewers to act ethically and just say, okay, I cannot review it for some reason mm -hmm. because there is a conflict of interest or it whatever. It just takes time and energy to avoid it entirely. Yeah, of course, right? of course, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, maybe we can have some questions from from the audience right now. So if you could maybe raise your hand, or you can put the questions in the chat, or any comments, anything that you'd like to add, maybe from your own your, your own experience as well. Hmm? Um, I can't see any uh, any hands raised and. And you mentioned Roxanne, you mentioned something about the timeline as well. Uh, maybe you could. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, I you know <laughs> I've had papers come out like three months, six months after submission. Um, and I've had papers that took like five years to get into print, um, either because the revision process was extended. Sometimes, sometimes a paper just goes to the wrong reviewer. And if you're a junior scholar, it's hard to find the wherewithal to say, I don't agree with this review. Um, I had sent in a, a long time ago, I sent in a paper that looked at three very different novels, um, but in one context, they all made, the, the novels themselves all made the same argument. And but one of them was an, a highly canonical novel and it went to a specialist on that author. And it was just, it was just the wrong reviewer because the reviewer just wanted the paper, the whole paper to be about that one particular novel and, and ignored everything else that was going on in the paper and ignored the argument actually. So it took like two years to sort of work with the editor to get over that particular issue and then when we finally realized, okay, well, this is what's going on here. Um, let's just kind of start from scratch. And then, then the whole thing went. And of course, during that time, I was busy working on, you know, numerous other things. So I was letting it sit fallow for months on end, not getting to the next set of revisions. Not that I didn't want to do them or didn't think they were necessary, but it simply had other things to do, right? I was building a career as quickly as possible because I started my job when I was in my forties. And, uh, and I wanted to be a full professor as, you know, really quick um, because, you know, I'm never going to get to retire anyway. Um, and so you're, it's, this is just, this was not having the confidence to get this sorted out at the beginning. So the timeline is very, is very variable. What happens with IRCL, because right now we do have this long queue for general issues, is we're, as soon as it's accepted for, for publication, we are uh, giving a, a formal letter to the contributor to say, this is formally accepted, it's going to come out in, the next, in this particular issue. And, and so then we know that there's a, you know, a, a timeline that anything else that has to happen to the article is going to be my own my own uh, editorial interventions and it will come back to the author several more times like you are not done with it till it is in print 
right? So we just uh, we we just sent out the proofs for the the next issue of IRCL, which will be the first issue of next year. So like we're in November, and this is when when it has to go out. Um, and it has it has a very tight timeline. Proofs have a tight timeline. You have to look at it, and and then so now they know they're in the home stretch. The contributors to this issue, but they sent their proposals for this issue to me and the guest editor a solid eighteen months ago. So that's actually a pretty average timeline from from proposal to print. Um, and you, you have to understand that these things come out when they come out and balanced against that. I mean, if you're on the job market, having that formal acceptance really matters. But if you are in a job, your faculty evaluation committee actually really won't um, credit a publication till it's in print. So those things have to be balanced as well. I mean, if I was going up for tenure and promotion, I would probably want a faster turnaround time than I'm able to give authors right now. Um, but the special issues, of course, they're on a much shorter timeline. Um, they're, they're, quite, they're quite fixed. Oh, we have a question here. Justina, you're uh, you're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought when, I the, when the question popped up, we all got muted. Oh really? Oh, yeah. that's strange. Oh, okay, but now you can hear me, right? Uh, so first the questions in the chat, and then Agnieszka's question. Uh, so uh, the the first one from Carrie Yenny Thomas. Of course, we should find the best fit for our articles, but it's a good idea to try to publish in a lot of different journals. Um, I lost it, sorry, different uh, journals in the field uh, or, oh, I'm sorry. I'm to sorry. focus on a few journals. Yeah, I yeah, see yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Carrie Ann, it's a good question. There's not dozens and dozens of, of journals that look at children's literature. So um, I would certainly, if, if I were, you know, just starting out working in this field, I would certainly aim high, aim for IRCL, for CHLA quarterly or annual, the lion and the unicorn. Um, you, you want your paper to fit the journal. So, uh, you know, all of those journals I just listed, they all have quite different agendas. So get to know the journals. Um, I don't think that I would, I would send a children's lit paper if I were a junior scholar to a generalist kind of journal. Like in Canada, we have the Association for College and for Canadian College and University Teachers of English, um, which is very much a generalist journal, like all of English studies, you know. And I wouldn't send I wouldn't send my paper there um, because it's it's neither fish nor flesh. It's I would want to send it to children's literature experts, and I know that's who's going to be reading it if I send my paper to the lion and the unicorn. Um, so I would I would concentrate on those specialist journals because they're all very good journals, and and you're also trying to make connections with this particular cohort of scholars, this international cohort of scholars. So um, yeah, I wouldn't, and I actually don't send to a lot of generalist journals anyway. My other, my research is all American literature and culture and the other stuff that I work on, I send to particular journals that are, are very focused on America. Like the Society for the Study of American Women Writers has a wonderful journal called Legacy. So I love to publish there. Um, and you, you do want to try to hit the top journals in the area, not just one. Um, you're not going to publish everything in, in one or two journals. So know the field. And also when you are, you're writing, say, a term paper, for me, I was writing a term paper, I think the first one I published, I looked at my bibliography, where did the articles that I was using come from? And that's where I sent the paper. And it got published. So I think that's probably how I would approach it. Justina, do you want me to just continue down these questions? Or maybe or Agnieszka will ask, um, please ask right. a question that will continue with the chat. Mm -hmm. Yes, Agnieszka, please. Sure, thank you very much. I'm sorry, it took me uh, quite a time to figure out how to raise my hand, but I, I got that now. 
so I have a question uh, that is um, a little bit different. Uh, I've been a guest editor on a journal recently, and I don't have like, you know, a huge experience here. And I was just wondering, because we were sending, I was a co-editor, so we were sending um, the articles to peer reviewers. And obviously I tried to take care to find the most suitable reviewers uh, possible. And most of these reviews, they were incredibly helpful, really um, to the point and really helping the authors to figure out how to make the article better. But some were not. Some were very, um, how would I put it, explicit in uh, their unhappiness with, with the article. And I didn't find them very helpful to the authors. So wh what is your experience here? Like, what do you do if, if this is the case? If you know that actually the review will not be helpful at all, uh, it will just be sort of uh, hurtful, basically. So wh what would your advice be here? Thank you, Ignisha. That's a really good question about a very touchy subject. Um, I, every editor, every journal editor I know, um, and for the book series that I am general editor for as well, we edit. <laughs> we edit those comments. Um, I am not sending mean, hateful, hurtful comments to any scholar, particularly not to junior scholars. Um, so I will edit. I, if I get a, even a PDF, I will find a way to edit down a PDF review that is saying awful things. Um, there has to be something useful in it. They've read the thing and they have some, I mean, they have an issue, obviously, um, but they don't need to be mean. That's kind of my motto in life. Nobody needs to be mean. We can all be kind and supportive, um, even if we're critical. So, um, and if an if a entire review is just nasty, I will summarize its salient points and turn that into the review. And the contributor will never know, and I will never tell anyone what I've done, including the peer reviewers. Um, but I will make sure that the the contributor is getting the information that they need, um, and without any uh, extraneous um, comments. So Thank you. does that help? I mean, I, I, this as, 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 the, as a senior editor, um, yeah, my job is to get the best articles I can for my journal and my book series. And that is one way to do it without making sure that um, somebody is devastated. There's just no, no need for that. Thank you. That's actually incredibly helpful because this is what I did. I, I, I've done some serious editing on the reviews, uh, but I was just wondering whether I, I had doubts, whether that's acceptable really. And would you, I'm not saying I've done this, but if the, if the review is really like not to the point at all, you know, everyone can have a bad day, a reviewer, you know, hurting tooth or whatever. Uh, so if the review is really not to the point, would you send it out to someone else? Like to find a third reviewer because that's okay. Yeah, I do that all the time. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fantastic. It doesn't happen particularly often. If I and if I if no. I get two reviews that are fine, that are like done well, but they're conflicting with each other, then I need a third reviewer. So then it's going to take make the process stretch out longer. But I will have a third reviewer, and then I might say, okay, so the third review comes in, but if and it's on this side, then those two reviews are going in this one. I'm not going to worry about. Or again, I will take anything that actually works from it and send it out in an edited format. Okay, that's fantastic. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Roxanne, please, please continue with the, uh, sure. with the chat if you could. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth um, has asked a question about turning dissertation into a monograph. I think the book is actually called Turning Your Dissertation into a Book. Um, it is it is just that simple. <laughs> it's written in English and uh, and yeah, it's just just Google it. I'm pretty sure it'll it'll pop right up. There's actually another good book. Here's and I have the exact title. Writing your journal article in 12 weeks. It's an expensive book. Get your university library to buy it. Um, but it actually works. <laughs> Um, I work with a lot of reluctant writers, and when I was associate dean research, I kind of 
would beat them over the head with that book. Um, <laughs> just say, here, just go do it. You have all this data, go write it up here. This will help you. Um, there's nothing wrong with looking at those kind of reference sources, but those books tend to be expensive. So make your university buy them. Uh, Okay, Sarah has asked that she has found monograph chapters or chapters in an edited volume based on a previously published article in journals. Um, okay, it's a good question. My, um, my first background was in uh, librarianship and basically the rule of thumb around the world is that your, your book goes into is, is called a, a new edition, a second edition, when you have changed 30% of its content. So um, that's kind of my rule of thumb with this sort of thing. So uh, I am working on a monograph right now and I will send out, I have already published um, a book chapter that will end up being part of that monograph. And my rule is going to be that I will have to add another 30% plus to a journal article that I published to turn it into a chapter for my book. Um, so you're looking at, at taking, um, I think here's a good, here's probably my best example, um, working on three, so the article that I'm just about to send out is looking at three novels in a particular context um, for a particular argument for a special issue of a journal. When it be that when that article becomes a chapter in my monograph, I'm probably going to add another three or more novels to the discussion, which will expand the journal article into a book chapter. And it won't be like this was the book chapter, and then I'm going to add this chunk. It's going to be stretching it out and adding throughout what stood as an article um, into a chapter, turning it into a chapter that way. So I think, I think that would be how I would look at it. You of course have to, I mean, if, you've, if, you've, if you're putting together a monograph, um, you need to credit the journal where, and you will see this um, in, in the acknowledgements page that parts of chapter X appeared in this issue of this journals and that and you have the citation but of course it's only you can only put parts because it would be very hard like you would have to really work to find out which which paragraphs because nothing should be actually intact as it appeared in the journal um, for your for the book chapter so that th that's the difference there um, but again I think to just kind of keep that at least 30 percent new material um, to move one to the other um, probably would work well. Okay, I have a, another Justina on how to respond to reviews when one of them is positive and the other one is highly negative. So if an editor has sent you the reviews pretty much as they came in and uh, one of them is supportive, something like a recommendation like publish with minor or even major um, revisions and then the other one is revise and resubmit. Um, I've, I do send out reviews that look somewhat conflicting um, but your editor should and if they haven't you can ask them you can go back and say okay well I've read the reviews and I'm happy to do the revisions but I have questions about uh, reviewer A says this um, and this works, and but reviewer B wants this fixed. Um, can you tell me where I should put my energy? If, if the editor hasn't said this reviewer um, wants to revise and resubmit for these reasons, and I think you should focus your energy on this because that's the kind of thing I say, um, I'll say, I, I, you need to pay attention to to these points in this review um, that the other review has got some, you know, because because it was more positive, basically, it's a polishing kind of thing. Go with that, do that, or don't do that. But but I, I tend to give that sort of guidance when the reviews are fairly different, um, but different in terms of a continuum, as in they both, one sees the article as weaker, but in the same areas as the other one wants just some polishing. Okay, so they're not they're not arguing about the article. They are both saying that it it's good, but it needs a lot of work here, here, and here. 
um, except that one reviewer wants a lot more work. And, and so I would offer some guidance. And if you're getting these reviews and you just don't know what to do or where to start, ask the editor. Quite often the answer is going to be, um, and they should have said, I'm, once you send me the revisions, I will send it out again for review, which means you really do need to pay attention to the reviewer that said revise and resubmit. Because they're, and that, that is where the, that is most likely where the article is going to go back to is that reviewer. So that is the one you need to make happy. Okay, that's the advice you probably should take. But there is nothing wrong with going back to an editor and saying, I, I need some, I need your guidance, please. I'm happy to do the work. I just need you to help me focus on what work I actually should be doing. So I hope that helps. Um, Uh, okay, I have a question about if a paper gets rejected by IRCL at the end, even though it's gone through the peer review process, would I suggest to resubmit it sometime later in the future when it's better refined or even rewritten? Um, yes, absolutely. It does need to be substantially reconstructed. Um, obviously, if it's gone through the process and been, been rejected, you know, as, as the process has, has played out, then it needs a lot of work. Um, at, at, at that point, um, part, of, part of the work you're doing at that point, you need to spend time with the journal to look at the things that are in print in the journal um, and to figure out where that paper has fallen short and how to figure out how to address those problems. There's nothing wrong with trying it at another journal. Um, I, uh, when I was at Queens, I think in the second year of my PhD, I ended up being TA for the department head who was a long established Milton scholar. And uh, this was back in the days of paper. <laughs> so he, he showed me, he literally had finished an article and he printed it up three times and he had it in envelopes for three different journals. And of course you cannot submit to more than one journal at a time. That is any, you, and just don't ever do it. Just simply don't do it. Um, you will make enemies that will last for the rest of your life uh, because we're all having a really hard time finding enough reviewers for the articles we send out. And if a reviewer gets the same article from two different journals, they're gonna lose their mind and they're gonna lose their mind on me. Um, so, don't do it. Um, but what he did is he took, he would rank the journals he wanted to send it to. He'd get these three envelopes ready and he would just send off the first one. And if it came back with a rejection, he would just throw it in the recycling and send off the second one. Now that is a level of confidence I will never have, but that's the point is that if, if you've done all your work on this article and IRCL doesn't want it, maybe you need to take a step back and look at some other journals. But again, you need to spend some time with these journals and figure out where their focuses are, where are they, where, what, what do they want, what do their articles look like. Um, make sure you, you're no, understanding the field, but no, there's nothing wrong with taking an article and saying, okay, I've gotten some good advice. I didn't quite get it there. I'm going to take some time away from it, but I'm going to go back to it. I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to send it back to IRCL with a cover letter saying, okay, I've done all of these things to it. I'd really like it to go back out for peer review. And I will send it back out for peer review and we'll start from scratch. Okay. Uh, question, can I propose a topic and set of texts from a conference to go through peer review? Um, okay, your conference paper is not an article. It's not a publishable article. It's not long enough. It is. It, it should. It should have been a little bit more conversational than we're expecting to put into print, and you need to work on it. And this is the point. I mean, if it's your first conference paper or your junior scholars and their conference papers, take it to a senior person in your department in your field, and say, okay, what do I do with this to turn it into an article? Where, where do I need to expand? Um, what else needs to happen to it? Um, don't ever send off a conference paper as is. That's not gonna fly. Um, you, can, you can certainly 
email editors to say, this was what my conference paper was about. Are you interested? And if I'm interested, I'm going to say yes. But I, and I may take the time to help you figure out what you need to do to turn it into an article, which is no guarantee of publication. It still has to go through peer review. Um, but yeah, you need to, you should consult and think about, about your conference papers. Um, if you, you know, 10 years from now, if you're sitting there and you have got this many conference papers on your CV and only this many articles, you're not doing your job. Your job is to publish every research paper that you present at a conference. Your conference paper is just to test drive this material. And if you're, if you've got a backlog of conference papers that you haven't turned into articles, you're not doing your job because your job is to get those things into print because those are good ideas, good research, important things that you had to say. And they've only been said to a room full of people when they actually need to be in print to speak to a whole bunch of other people. So get them out there. Um, this is something I, the, with my department members right now, I'm, I am knocking on a lot of doors and saying, excuse me, but you just gave this great conference paper and it was well received. And what are you doing with it? Because if it's just sitting there fallow, then it's meaningless uh, and certainly meaningless in terms of building your career. Um, let's have a question from Kinga right now. Yes, please. That's okay. Kinga, please. Mm -hmm. Kinga, can you speak a little bit louder? Sorry, we can't hear you. Or closer to the microphone, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Better? Barely. But maybe I can type my question. Okay, so please type your type your question, Kinga. Yeah. And there is another one from Marina in the chat. How can we avoid a desk rejection? We've been talking a lot about that, but I mean. Um, <laughs> Uh -huh, nice. Well, uh, the desk rejections um, that fall off of my desk tend to look like unexpanded conference papers or unrevised essays for coursework. Um, and if they look like that, that's, that's what they're going to go. They won't have a solid argument. They will have a front-loaded lit review and or theoretical framework that's been constructed um they won't look like the articles in the journal so to avoid a desk rejection again read articles in the journal you want to submit to and if if and if, if and then look at yours and go okay i know what i need to do now or this looks like that um and, and when I say read articles in the journal, I'm talking about active readership, where you pick up that journal, pull an article out of it, and say, okay, there, that's, that's the thesis. This is the focus of this essay. I know what's going to do. Oh, there's, there's, there's the map. I can see subheadings, or I can see a, a sentence or two that outlines what this paper is going to do, where it's going to take me. Oh, there, there's a topic in this paragraph, and that topic feeds directly into the thesis. Oh, there's, there's another one, right? That, that there's no that the signposts are there, that the argument is carefully formulated and well supported. However, that's done with data sets and charts or with just good close readings. So um, if your article looks like that, then it probably won't be a desk rejection. Uh, Kinga, I'm gonna go to you. Um, well, since you're clearly still a student, Kinga, I would actually say, um, do you have term papers that are suitable to turn into articles? Because you've already done that work. And if you can turn them into articles, um, I'm very suspicious of professors in grad programs who only want short papers. My professors at Queen's were very clear. They wanted papers that were really of a length to send out. They weren't send outable. Um, you know, when I submitted them, but after I got them back with the grade and worked on them, took them to back to my professor, took them to my to senior colleagues in the grad program, um, that was a good way to get articles out there, um, at least in submission. And I learned a lot with those early articles, but, uh, but that's one way to do it. Um, if you don't have those resources, then I would suggest you take part of your dissertation in, into articles. Um, you can publish 
two or three, I wouldn't say more than three articles from something that will become a monograph. And I've already just talked about that, but you certainly could say, okay, well, this chapter of my dissertation is done and it's good. What's the best part of it? And can I send that out as, as an article? Um, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And in fact, if you do that, um, of course, your defense committee, your thesis committee is going to look upon your dissertation with favor if part of it's already, you know, out. So um, those would be the two things I would go at. I would say do not start a separate line of research for an article while you're on your dissertation because you need to get the dissertation done. My, I had two supervisors for my dissertation and one of them said the only good thesis is a done thesis. So get her done and move on. Okay, I think I got that. King is smiling, so I think we're good. Um, I have a question here. Is there a need for country specific studies or topics for international children's literature journal? Um, well, uh, the next special issue of IRCL coming out is called Asian Voices in Children's Lit. So that certainly um, is a specific country themed issue. Um, my goal for IRCL, because it is an international issue, is to have representation from you know, 10, 10 countries at least in through the through the course of the journal. Um, and to try not to double up on continents in the like we usually have seven articles an issue, to try not to double up on, on continents at least, to try to or countries, to try to make sure that I have um, that it's not too Anglo-centric and that there's good representation from around the world. So that's a balancing act too. And I have to say that basically my first rule is as soon as it's accepted for publication it goes into the queue and I have not bumped anybody down to get that representation that the, the the issues the general issues have been sorting themselves out very well in terms of representation so it's not something that I I would say I'm, I don't go looking for particular things because I'm getting them I'm getting everything I think that that, that I want to see um, okay Okay, a question about translation. Um, and uh, this is not my area at all. And I think what I would say is that most of the, the articles that I've, I've had for Bookbird and, and for IRCL over the years, um, the contributors have done their own translations of the text into English. And in this new Asian Voices issue, there was um, there is an article coming um, that looks at three canonical translations of Huckleberry Finn into into Chinese, and at, at, at the things at the rhetorical strategies that the way that the translations work out, um, and it's it's very clear that the authors were are very good translators themselves, so they could undertake. The meaning behind these translations and how those meanings changed over the years that these three these three translations came out in China, um, but mostly I I'm seeing I'm seeing that the contributors are doing their own translations. I'm not sure I'm answering this question at all, um, but I think that I think it's about what you do with the source or to the source um, whether you are trying to adjust like you keep a lot from like what is there in the source or you try to domesticate so make it kind of more accessible i guess maybe too to um and actually that's what children. thank you justina yeah and, th th and that's what this article was doing was looking at at the way that the that the, these chinese translations of huckleberry finn were fitting in with chinese cultural codes when the translations were done so it was very critical of how the early ones um really changed Twain's text into, into supporting Chinese cultural codes um, without, and, and, and quite often at the loss of, of the, the humor was lost, of course, because Huckleberry Finn is very funny. So I don't have a preferred uh, translation strategy. Um, 
IRCL is not focused on translation studies. Um, so the, 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 the papers that we get that are very much translation and linguistic focused are not literary studies and they don't fit, right? That, that to my mind, I, I actually think there should be a journal. Um, I know that, that um, Amor O'Sullivan um, does do publish special issues or something about translation studies in children's lit, but like a, you know, a twice a year journal on translation studies in children's lit seems to me to be lacking because I, we, get, we get a number of articles, not tons, but we get eno enough articles that tells me that there's a need for this kind of journal, but this is not the journal I'm editing. Um, so for me that when translations are, are the subject, it's not about the actual work of translating, it's more about the cultural work of the text in translation. I hope that helps. Yeah, I'm not sure if there are any more questions. I can't see any. I'm not seeing more. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Agnieszka, do you want to ask any another question, or is just that, that your hand is still raised? Let's. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I it's okay. I, I don't use Zoom very often. I work with other programs, so I didn't. Right. That's I, fine. I, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't. Thank you. Thank you. If I can anything. just add, if I can just add something Please. about translation, if that's the place to do it. Of course. Um, I've had a, a fascinating discussion with a professional translator, literary or, or of literature, uh, for children actually, just recently, and we talked about this very issue, and he advised me like to think about function most of all. So if that piece is supposed to rhyme, make it rhyme. If that piece is supposed to be funny, make it funny. Even if it, you know, like the the literal translation s suffers from it somewhat think about the function first. So I don't know whether that's helpful or not, but um, well, I, I found it quite helpful in my own translations. So. I, I agree. Um, and, and there are ways for those questions to be taken up in, in articles that are literary criticism of translations and source texts, um, you know, without, without charts that are linguistic based charts that are not what IRCL does. Uh, thank you, Agnieszka, very much. I have uh, another uh, kind of uh, question, but in the private chat. Uh, Roxanne, if you could maybe recommend uh, several journals in our field? Uh, um, certainly. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So the children's IRCL, but <laughs> IRCL, yes, of course. International in focus. Yeah. Um, children's Literature Association has the quarterly and the annual. They do very different things. Um, again, I, I'm not going to describe these journals overly much because you really, if you're interested in publishing in them, you need to spend some time with them. Um, however, you, you manage to do that. The Lion and the Unicorn, um, I think it's a fine journal. It's, uh, and all of those are published um, as is Bookbird by Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, and they are, those are, they're, so they're all on Project Muse. They're all, um, they're all generating a good deal of income for their source organizations, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so those are, those are some of my favorites. Children's Literature and Education is a very good journal, um, which also has online access to a certain number, number of articles. So I, I like that one um, a, a good deal. Bookbird, because um, I was editor for three years, publishes shorter articles, literary criticism, certainly scholarly articles, but it's also a little bit friendlier because it's a magazine format. And there's images, uh, book cover images, because you can reproduce book covers without getting permission. So it has lots of book covers. It has, it has little reviews of children's books. It has longer reviews of scholarship. Um, it, it always has um, a column or has columns several times a year from the uh, Children's Library in Munich. Um, it has, it has uh, updates on IBI, um, the, the International Board on Books for Young People. So um, Bookbird is kind of a mixed bag. It was fun to edit. Um, and when, and I just published something in it because I had a short article that I 
it was a knockoff. It was a one-off for me. I wanted to talk about recipe books for kids, picture books that have recipes and talk about food. And so there was like a short article. It was a lot of fun to write and Bookbird, um, had, it's out in Bookbird and, and it was a hoot. Um, so that's, that's, Bookbird feels, I think, a particular niche. Um, the longer, denser, more scholarly articles, obviously IRCL, the other ones I've named. There's a lot more out there. There's, there's some young journals, Journal of Children's Literature. Um, I haven't published in there. I'm not that familiar with it, but I know it's got good people working. Um, I, I think that one thing to do that I would highly recommend for junior scholars in the field is go to the Children's Literature Association conference if you can. Um, it was online this, this last couple of years, and it, I think they might do a hybrid next year. But if you can get into their programs, they do a round table of journal editors, and it's a big round table. And I would go in there and find that list from this last conference and just kind of make that my to-do list for where I was going to send my articles. And of course, then the editor's names are all there. So there's people you can ask questions of, and, and they're all in that round table because we're all out there looking for the best scholarship that we can put in our journals. So, so I would, I would, I would think that that round table would be a really good resource ongoing. Um, and they're always looking for the new journals. They're always bringing them into it. So so try that, uh, of course. Um, and of course, you're, you know, you're all here. So you're on the, you should be on the IRSCL listserv. So there's lots of calls for papers coming out on that. Um, and you'll hear from editors on that as well, who are looking for special issues or advertising special issues or calls for paper. Um, IRCL has coming up the, uh, uh, the, the black issue I've been calling it, um, but it's it's uh, looking for international scholarship on black children's literature and culture. And, um, and of course we have the Congress issue has a call for papers and we have a Latin America special issue coming up that has a call for papers. And those are all on the IRSCL website as well. Um, I think that's the only special issues I can think of. The Children's Literature Association, when their, their website will certainly have their calls for, for papers for special issues. Um, but, but try to get tapped into, into as many of these listservs as you can and just keep an eye out for, for calls for papers, things like that. Not emails from people wanting your paper though. Thank you, Roxanne. There's just one more question in the chat from Rosalind, uh, again about translations, but I think very practical one mm -hmm. about picture books. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think if it were me, I think you need to be true to your own scholarship, Rosalind. And if you're working, if you're working full time, basically on, on the Dutch versions, um, you could certainly write a paper in English on those versions, make sure you have the translations, whether you do them or you take them from the English versions. But I think that, I think that your scholarship is where you should begin with your article um, without trying to fit yourself into somebody else's context, start with your own, have confidence in the work you're doing. Thanks a lot for that. <laughs> thank you, Rosalind, for the question. And thank you, Roxanne, for the, for the answer. So I think that's, uh, that's everything that we have um, on the chat. It's been almost 90 minutes, <laughs> Roxanne. Thank you so much. I think we should be uh, finishing. Uh, well, I hope we have this kind of sessions in the future as well, uh, after uh, maybe next year, we'll see, of course. But thank you, thank you so much, Roxanne, uh, for sharing your uh, expertise with us, for encouraging us, and there are comments, confirming that people have been encouraged. So that's, that's I think, what really matters. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions as well. Nicola, would you like to close it with the IRSCL, on, on an IRSCL note, if I may say so? I would love to, thank you. I um, reiterate Justina's comments, Roxanne, I learned a lot from listening to you. Thanks so much for so generously sharing your, your experiences. Um, I mean, and for particularly for um, emerging scholars, thinking very carefully about choosing 
relevant journals, taking feedback very um, as a form of, of I, when I was uh, um, doing my PhD, I, I saw the feedback from journal editors as kind of helping, helping me really a lot. Even if my journal article was, was rejected, I felt it really helped me to move my work along. And in terms of coming towards um, um, my thesis defense, I felt that I was covering ideas that might come up in my defense by listening to the to the um, feedback from the peer reviewers. And um, I think that's such a helpful approach. Um, such great advice about ensuring your um, theoretical framework goes throughout your um, article and that everything feeds into your argument. It sounds that it sounds simple, but it takes a long time to develop those those skills, doesn't it? I know I'm still always working on that. And, and it's not until I get fresh eyes on my work that sometimes I realize something is missing, that I haven't made a link, that my theory isn't all the way through. And, and um, really fabulous advice. Thank you so much. And also for the advice about um, being an editor, that was really helpful for me as well. Just I'm, I'm working on a special edition at the moment and it's very, very helpful to have that confidence about rewording feedback because as you say, it's, there's no point in, we're here to support. We don't need to um, um, uh, pass on a uh, really um, direct criticism. We can still um, summarize the, the, the essence of it in a way that's supportive. I really found the session very, very helpful. Thank you very much on behalf of the board of the International Research Society for Children's Literature. Once again, I invite people to um, join. Or well, something has happened, Nicola. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we can't hear you. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Somehow I muted myself, but okay. I've just put the link for joining again into uh, the chat. And um, to let you know also that um, the new um, coordinator of mentoring program, uh, Macarena Garcia Gonzalez, will be in touch with us all soon with the new mentoring program. So look out for that. But of course, you need to be on the on the on the um, list of. You need to be a that. member, and I are You need to be a member to receive yeah, to that. So, so do yeah. do join if you haven't already. Once again, Roxanne, thank you very much.